Good evening. It is my pleasure to be able to welcome you all to this 43rd annual Winifred E. Weider Lecture for Meritorious Scholarship. The Weider Annual Faculty Award Lecture was established in 1975 to honor Dr. Winifred E. Weider in the year of her retirement after she had served for 40 years as an SPU professor. The endowment to support the scholarship was given by another SPU emeritus professor, the late Ross Shaw. The Weider Lecture, uh, this is in the language specifying what this is for, quote, provides a public platform from which the claims of the liberal arts in the Christian university are espoused. And so each year, a faculty member is chosen by the faculty to receive this honor and to present, quote, scholarship informed by a Christian worldview. I, I myself never had the chance to meet Winifred Weider, although I know a number of you in this room did have that pleasure. She earned her doctorate in 1933 from the University of Chicago. And when she joined the SPU faculty, she was one of the very few members of the faculty who actually had an earned doctorate. Uh, she said herself later in life, a young lady with a brand new, unused PhD was pretty special. And uh, she was pretty special. Uh, she quickly set out to create uh, first a new class and eventually a whole new department for classical languages. And over the next 40 years, her passion for Greek and Latin inspired thousands of students. She was also interested in physical education. And she was SPU's first female coach, leading athletic programs for over a decade. Her great love of teaching and devotion to this institution left an indelible mark on a whole generation. So this lecture is a wonderful tribute to Dr. Weider's 40 years of service. And if she were here, and I gather she came to every one of these lectures from 1975 till 2001, but if she was here, I'm confident she'd be thrilled to hear tonight's presentation. And so with that, I want to turn this over to Dr. Margaret Brown to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Provost Van Duzer. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to thank Jen Wilson, who's been working indefatigably, indefatigably for the last half an hour trying to get some chairs out here that weren't set up. Jen, where are you at? OK, thank you so much. Can we all thank Jen for just making this happen? She's our assistant director in the Center for Scholarship and Faculty Development. And thanks to everyone else who helped with chairs and helped organize tonight's event. Uh, tonight, we have a very special honor of hearing from Dr. Brian Bantam, who's a professor in our School of Theology. It's an honor to introduce him to you this evening. He teaches courses in university foundations and the theology major, as well as in the seminary. His teaching and research focus on the intersection of theology and identity exploring how the claims of Christian identity are illumined and challenged by the realities of race, ethnicity, and gender. Dr. Bantam's first book, which if you haven't read, I encourage you to pick up both of these books. Um, his first book, Redeeming Mulatto, A Theology of Race and Christian Hybridity, explores how black mixed race identity illumines how race shapes us and reimagines Christians, Christian discipleship through Christ's body as both human and divine a union of flesh and divinity that remakes the lives of disciples into new people, a holy mixture of flesh and spirit. His second book, which we had the pleasure of hosting a book club on last year, The Death of Race, Building a New Christianity in a Racial World, offers the church ways of reimagining Christian claims regarding humanity, human fallenness, and Christ's work in light of modern race and racism. In addition to serving on the editorial board of the Journal of Theology and Literature, Dr. Bantam is a regular contributor to the Christian Century and has published numerous articles and chapters in academic journals and popular magazines. He has a really good Twitter feed as well. You can follow him on there. Um, his lecture tonight is entitled, The Artists Will Be My Priests, A Theology of the Iconic Body. Dr. Bantam will examine the implicit theology of the icon and how that shaped an understanding of what it means to be human and who could reflect God's image. Let's listen closely, reflect, and be edified, challenged, and convicted by what Dr. Bantam has to say to us this evening. Brian? Oh my gosh, there's a lot of people here. 
Thank you all so much for coming. Um, make sure this is loud enough for everybody. Um, it really is uh, a little overwhelming to see all these faces. Um, if your professor required you to be here, don't tell me. I'm just gonna, <laughs> gonna pretend like you all wanted to be here and are not taking notes and gonna get tested later. Um, but I wanna thank so much uh, Margaret Brown and her leadership at the Center for um, Scholarship and Faculty Development um, not just for all the work that goes into this lecture, but for the ways in which she supports us and pushes us as faculty um, on this campus throughout the year. So thank you so much, Margaret. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to start off a reading. We'll, we'll see how, how far that goes. But I'm a little like, I'm actually, I really am a little overwhelmed, so I'm going to read so I don't tear up. And then, um, and then we'll, see, we'll see how things go. Um, so at its heart, Christianity is a sensual faith. The word made flesh is a confession that what was once heard or felt in fleeting or ephemeral ways became tangible, felt, seen, present in ways that were at once paradoxical and irrefutable. As the early Jewish followers of Jesus continued to walk with him, a growing and disturbing reality would begin to emerge for them. Their God, the one whose name could not be enunciated, whose presence was signified more by a veil by, than presence and recognition, seemed to be walking with them, laughing with them. In Christ, the meaning of God's promise to them, I will be your God and you will be my people, becomes something more than an abstract promise and is now a person who walks with them. They see God walking in their midst. But the incarnation, far from subverting the belief in the body, in the, body, in the body's opposition to God, reminds us that our bodies, our lives, are something to be seen and to see. Just as Adam and Eve open their eyes to see one another and in that moment are confronted with a beautiful truth, that in this other, they, that they can see, touch, hear. They come to see themselves more truthfully. They come to see God more faithfully through this body that stands in front of them. So in the midst of, of seeming to have seen God, the earliest disciples walked carefully when it came to images and depictions of Christ and who God was. The Jewish sensibilities against creating graven images remained, even as Christianity shifted from a movement of Jews to a movement of Gentiles. Perhaps a subtle depiction of the Good Shepherd, who would adorn a wealthy Christian's tomb or home, might have a mural depicting a biblical passage that centered on a community's devotion. When Constantine comes into power in the fourth century, we see a broader use of images as the church moves from marginality to power. Images become a means of signifying Christian identity and God's work among the people. Whether in the architecture or paintings or frescoes or mosaics, images, much like the emperor's own image, begin to communicate devotion, power, and communicate a way of seeing the world. In the East, however, this interrelationship between image and faith would become a well-developed theology of the icon, a deep and generative attempt to consider the truth of Jesus' person as human and divine, as a visual and anthropological phenomenon. As we gaze at the icon, as we kiss it, we are drawn into the image that it reflects. We pray that we might too come to reflect that image. The image is living, if you will. Pavel Florensky, the Russian theologian, describes the icon as a transfixing, an enunciation that proclaims in color the spiritual world. Therefore, icon painting is the occupation of a person who sees that world as sacred. In this presence of icon writing, the writer, the artist, is the one who prays, who mediates this presence into the world through a union of contemplation and skill and insight. At its heart, the theology of the icon is a theology of personhood, 
suggesting that, we, that who we are is more than a soul. Who we are is somehow inextricably bound to the materiality of our lives together. Spirit and flesh and that we are more than what we see. But what we see is also essential to who we are. And so what these early theologies of the icon had their finger on was an understanding of the inevitable relationship between flesh and spirit, between the material conditions of our lives and the notions of spirit and spirituality that animate who we are and who we believe that we ought to be. Put differently, the Eastern theology of the icon acknowledged and sought to theologically account for what I call an economy of visuality. By economy of visuality, I mean the currents of sense, sight, sound, touch, taste, through which we experience and express our world. Our lives are continually navigating, seeing and being seen, accounting for all of the differences that we see among ourselves in the world and in the very universe. Theorist Maurice Morlo-Ponty suggests this phenomenon is one of navigating space. This is kind of a longish quote, so I, I put it up there for you. I do not reflect, he says. I live among things. And I vaguely consider space sometimes as the milieu of things, sometimes as their common attribute. Or I reflect, I catch hold of space at its source. I think at this moment of the relationship that are beneath this word. And I notice this is the, in this way that they are not only sustained through a subject who traces out and bears them. I pass from spatialized space to spatializing space. What Merleau-Ponty is pressing here is that perception, how we see, visuality is not simply a theological concept. It is a fact of human recognition and navigation in the sensing world. We cannot move our way around this world without some sense of perception, some sense of accounting for the world that we see, whether through our eyes or through our ears or through touch. We perceive the world in manifest ways. And so what I want to investigate this evening is how this economy of visuality develops in the West and how that shapes our contemporary life because it happens in a very different way in the West than it does in Eastern theology. So the icon is not an explicitly theological phenomenon. So we are inundated with advertisements, screens, media. Images are ubiquitous. We know these images shape us even as they reflect aspects of who we are, or at least we believe ourselves to be. Notions of beauty, danger, peace, what is healthy or successful can be equated with visual cues or icons, if you will. I mean, even these, right, we have a kind of meaning. For some of the folks of my kind of maybe middle ages generation, Facebook, like, oh yeah, Facebook, that's, that's cool, right? Like that's where you get to know everybody and all this. And my son's like, he's like, no, Snapchat. Or I was like, oh, I sent you a text. I didn't check text. I was like, why do you not check text? He's like, Cause you get, did you DM me on Instagram? I was like, why would I do that? <laughs> when I can just text you, I don't understand, right? So already in these images alone, we see meaning, right? There are associations that are beginning to happen. But even inside of these platforms, you see that little mosaic thing, whoa, I work so hard on that. <laughs> right? We take images of ourselves and then we post them, right? Or in a way, maybe even we curate our own life. So this is my Instagram, I have, I have Instagram, right? This is the best parts of my life, right? <laughs> me, and my, me and my love, just, we just, uh, we, um, we did a wedding, and that was us all looking fly. So we got put on Instagram. Right? <laughs> and then this was like the one Sunday out of like 20 Sundays that my son and I decided to build something. But you put it on Instagram, building Sunday, because that's who I am. I'm creative. I'm a maker, man. <laughs> right? So what am I doing? I'm creating a visual identity, right? I'm curating my own identity. And then we have lots of other people do it. I asked my son, I was like, who would be really cool to put up here? 
the Danny Seals era in, in, in Zendaya. <laughs> so we all do this, right? And so we're caught up. We're, they're looking at us, we're looking at them, we're th looking at us, looking at them. And it's all, there's just this constant current of perception, right? And we are navigating it, trying to think about who we are in the midst of it. What do we do in the midst of this? And so all of these images, though, are always pointing beyond themselves and are part of a network of meaning and values that shape us and that we participate within it. But of course, the church is not immune to this visuality either. Whether the hipster pastor with tattoos and a Goodwill jacket, that's, that's my pastor, Pastor Eugene Cho. <laughs> so I'm, I'm calling him out on it. So I love the fact that he shops at Goodwill, but you know, it's, it's a visual thing. It's like, hey, I shop at Goodwill, right? It's doing work all the time. Or Joel Osteen, who definitely does not shop at Goodwill. <laughs> And so all of these preachers, right, are doing visual work, even in their presentation of themselves. So the church is not immune. We are all looking at this. There is an economy of visuality buzzing from the pulpit and back again, over and over and over again. But of course, these preachers are not just happening in a vacuum, in a void, right? They happen inside spaces. There are cathedrals, there are churches, there are storefronts. There are frames for these preachers, for these pastors that look many, many different ways. How did we get, get, get at this? So at the same time, even without paintings or murals or stained glass windows, visuality is permeating those spaces. There are things to see and things not to see. And so when we consider the central images and sounds of our sacred spaces, even in their many diversities, we are confronted with a troubling commonality, the centrality of men in the pulpits, in images, in prayers. Again and again in our worship life, we encounter a mysterious God through male voices and male bodies. All I did was Google preachers, images, and this is what came up. I had to scroll, like, I was scrolling for like five minutes before I saw the first woman. What does that mean to us? What does it mean to see that reality Sunday after Sunday, right? Everywhere you go. So my concern this evening is how this inevitable relationship unfurls in the Western church and how this economy of visuality continues to permeate our lives in our Christian spaces. And so I want to suggest that the question of the image is the question of the body, and that the body is a question of the image. To begin to account for the differences of our world and the significance of the word made flesh, we have to begin to account for the visuality of our world, the visuality of spaces and worship, and the visuality of our lives together. To think through this question, I want to approach the iconicity of bodied life through two angles or questions. So by iconicity of bodied life, what I mean simply is to say that in the same way that we see all of these images and we have meaning, we see meaning in them, you all carry meaning in your bodies and in your lives. So we all have an iconicity to us. We are, in a sense, revelatory of things or in some ways navigating meanings and ideas that we did not intend to be attached to our bodies. So this, I want to look at this through two different lenses. So the first is the emergence of what I am calling the Protestant icon. How in a movement that expressly sought to suppress images in many cases, and in other cases sought to reduce images to primarily didactic purposes, can we even speak of a Protestant icon? It would seem sacrilegious, right? Or put differently, what happens to an economy of visuality when it is seemingly denied? I'll give a hint here, it's not good. <laughs> the second approach offers a way forward. I want to suggest that the artist should be our priests. By this I mean in a world where, vi where visuality and sensuality is an indelible and vital aspect of what it means to be human, 
and a necessary means to understand and live into God's life with us, our hope will not come in simply reading more books. Yes, I said that. <laughs> we need an understanding, a way of experiencing and seeing the world that draws us more deeply into the materiality of God's creative life. I take this to be the heart of the theological task that Christ Christology and theological anthropology ought to trace patterns and movements of refraction that illumine or obscure us. I return again and again to artists as guides for what it means to navigate this world, how visual artists see and represent the world and who we are and might be, called to see the world they not only observe but must create, they cut, they bind, they crush, they layer, build, fold, until there was something where there was once no thing. But in the wake of the colonial project, for the black artist or any other artist of color, and women, women artists as well, this task was an extension of being seen in the world. That those who were in a sense told again and again that they were not human, through the artistic task, created and articulated their own humanity into being again and again and again. And so navigating the visceral nodes of contact that render one's body an aesthetic or anesthetic presence, they create. As Toni Morrison reminds us in The Bluest Eye, was there ever a more dangerous idea in the world than beauty? The idea that who we are and our worth or our possibilities are indelible to our bodies and can be seen and weighed and measured. In a way, visual artists witness to the reality of a current of visuality that permeates all of us. That is, we see and are seen, we touch and we taste and we listen. And all of these things are fundamental aspects of what it means to be made a human being, to be made in the image of God. It was all of these things were part of what it means when God said, God intended, when God said it's good, right? And so for me, visuality is a curious site of identity and identification that requires a theological accounting given the claim that we are made in the image of God. Of course, most of us know the question of God's visuality was an aspect of the controversy and scandal surrounding the claims of Jesus' divinity. Maybe you don't, but just pretend like you do for right now, because I only have 50 minutes. <laughs> and would continue in the debates regarding iconoclasm and iconophilia throughout the church's history. So basically, iconoclasm is, I'm going to tell you because I'm a teacher. <laughs> iconoclasm is the kind of the hatred of images. And so this, like, this idea that God is so holy that we should not, we should be worshiping God who is invisible, not a kind of, a kind, not a kind of copy of who God is. And then when we worship the copies of God, we are not, it becomes a kind of idolatry and points us away from the kind of true God. And so you see this kind of iconoclastic sensibility arise in the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries, and then you see it kind of pop up again in the Protestant Reformation, which is what we're, we're going to talk about this, after, this evening. So the Protestant Reformation was a period of profound upheaval, not only in theological terms, rapidly expanding ways of knowing, gleaned from the Renaissance and knowledge gleaned from humanist, intellectual, and artistic inquiry, as well as technological advances um, that expanded the means of both um, discovering knowledge and disseminating that knowledge. The world is just transforming. It's, just, it's a, this is kind of radical change, much and very much in the ways I think that we can think of our life right now. And so Martin Luther, the kind of one of the kind of founders of this Protestant Reform, Reformation movement, he opposed the papacy uh, because, because he believed um, he had questions about doctrine and practice, practice really primarily. And while questions over the Lord's Supper Baptism, church polity roiled and continually splintered the reformers even after their split from the Catholic Church, um, and can maybe continues to do so today. The question of images also was a central question for these reformers. So they'd be arguing about baptism, they'd be arguing about salvation by faith, and they'd be arguing about images. 
You'd have people breaking into churches and smashing statues and tearing um, paintings down and off the wall. So while the Catholic Church, though, saw a wide range of visual elements in its worship, in devotional life, whether it's images of Mary, to other saints, to statues, to elaborate vestments of the priests and the bishops, um, to even the Eucharistic altar itself as a kind of visual element in um, Catholic spaces. And so visuality was a vital aspect of piety in lives who were seeking to live into the kingdom of God. And so this is not to say that Catholic notions of images mirrored, mirrored Eastern theologies of icons. They were, they were different. So still in the Catholic, in the West, they would say they would use images, a variety of different images, and the church would still say um, that these were meant for pointing us towards the gospel, pointing us towards um, the goodness of who God is, whereas the, in the East, there is a kind of living, almost presence maybe, um, in, the, in, in between these two. But the Reformation... This that is the, a curious, is a, becomes a kind of curious movement of retrieval and innovation, but it continues to struggle with the question of visuality. But this economy was now caught within a very different set of questions, and consequently, a fundamentally different framework of possibilities. The differences and similarities of the three primary reformers um, kind of shows us something of these varying understandings of of what it was. And so one of the most iconoclastic reformers, so, so this is one of the people that was most violently, literally violently opposed to images, was Andreas Karlstadt. 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 I gotta, gotta, Karlstadt. Right, if I'm guttural enough, I'll, I'll pass it along the right pronunciation. Uh, but listen to what he says about images, right? He says, God hates and is jealous of pictures, as I will demonstrate, and considers them, them an abomination, and proclaims that all men in his eyes are like the things they love. Pictures are loathsome. It follows that we also become loathsome when we love them. Thus images bring death to those who worship or venerate them. Tell us how you really feel, Andy. <laughs> So obviously, he is not a fan, right? So this is a woodcut of um, some of the iconoclasts kind of being in their, their sense of faithfulness. So as we can see, Karstadt is a, a fairly unambiguous in his contempt for images. Um, but his point was fundamentally actually Christological. Um, he says, we worship a risen Jesus, a Jesus who sits at the right hand of God, and that's where his body is. It's not anywhere else, right? And so if we worship God, we worship a God whose image cannot be captured where we are right now, and any attempt to capture that image is ultimately an act of idolatry because we worship now a Christ who is with God. So in a refrain that we actually see with, through all of the reformers, the body of the Christ is not found in an image, but it's found in the people. So there is a kind of this kind of democratic unfolding, right? So we're moving away from the images, the altar, the things that we see at the front in kind of quote unquote Catholic spaces, what the reformers thought they were doing was in a sense unfolding the image onto the bodies of all people who were in the congregation. We collectively are now the body of Christ. When people see us, they see Christ in some form or fashion. Now that's pretty deep, okay? We can, we can maybe work with that. But does it work out that way? Not usually. So John Calvin, um, a slightly different way of thinking about this, he suggests, um, he, wrote, he would write regarding images, he says, God has forbidden two things. First, the making of any picture of him. The other is that no image may be worshiped. He continues, the setting up of images in churches is a defiling act. By and by, folk go and kneel down to it. The papists paint and portray Jesus Christ, who, as we know, is not only man, but also God, manifested in the flesh. He is God's eternal Son, in whom the fullness of the Godhead dwells, yes, even substantially. Should we have portraitures and images whereby only the flesh may be represented? 
Is it not a wiping away of that which is the chiefest in our Lord Jesus Christ, that is to wit, his divine majesty? Right? So you kind of catch a little bit what Calvin's trying to say here. It's like if we believe that God is flesh and spirit, then you have to be able to capture both equally. And because you can't capture spirit, you shouldn't do flesh. And so what we see here is actually his chapel in Geneva, right? Um, we see maybe architecture doing the work, but there are no images, there's no paint. It is stone and wood and a pulpit. Of course, it should be said here that not all reformers were stridently against images, as, as stridently against images. This more moderate view is encapsulated best by Martin Luther. Like many reformers, Luther had a suspicion of images. He thought that they could be moved towards idolatry in what he saw the idolatry that they represented and perhaps even could draw us into. But yet at the same time, Luther was a little bit more liberal in allowing vestments and banners. But like Calvin and Zwingli, he would whitewash his sanctuary walls. Um, images and paintings for the most part would be taken down unless they were altarpieces like this, um, painted by um, Cronach the Elder. Um, leaving only ornately or carved pulpits or altars. And the preacher would stand before the gathered people, sharing the good news to be heard and received. This idea of heard becomes very, very important. As the Protestant Reformation moves on, we start to see more and more conversations about how do we actually restructure, design spaces so that everyone can hear. Because salvation comes what? By hearing, right? So like other reformers, Luther had the suspicion of images and what he saw as the idolatry that they represented. Um, in a fascinating study of Luther and Cronach the Elder's collaboration, historian Stephen Osment writes, in the aftermath of the iconoclastic controversy, Cronach and Luther collaborated on the images that would fill the Protestant churches. Both men had an interest in keeping decorative art and portraiture prominently on display. For Cronach, the church art was, this pant was, was the painter's staple. For Luther, while for Luther, art gave the gospel sermon immediately in the church a captive audience. He's like, look, we can, make, we can create a picture of what faithfulness looks like, and all these people have to sit here and look at it. Let's do it. <laughs> that, was the, that was the conversation in the back office. So Luther's work with Chronic the Elder in an interesting way, actually mimics the relationship between the Eastern priest and the icon writer. Luther understood a critical relationship between the visual and the word preached, and ultimately for the life of the congregant. But notice a critical difference in Luther and Cronach's economy. The one who sits in this ecclesial space is primarily a hearer of the word. The images are subservient to the deeper, more fundamental truth of the word spoken. In this relationship, the image becomes didactic. That is, it becomes only intended to teach. It becomes subservient to the word that is preached. And this notion of instruction is important. If the initial impulse behind Luther's thinking bears a certain resemblance to, Catholic, to a Catholic clarification of images, that would emerge in the Council of Trent in 1563, where the bishop, it says, the bishop shall carefully teach this, that by means of the histories of the mysteries of our redemption, portrayed by paintings or other representations, the people are instructed, instructed, and confirmed in the habit of remembering the, and continually revolving in mind the articles of faith as also that great profit is derived from all sacred images. So again, images teach us what we, what we had heard to be true. They show us a kind of way of what something should look like. So images oriented the viewer towards faith, allowing and allowed them insight into what faithfulness has looked like um, and what it might look like in their lives whether in stained glass windows, illuminated manuscripts, pocket-sized images of saints, these all served to visualize the mysteries of redemption in Catholic, in Catholic teaching. But for the reformers, the mysteries of redemption could not be imaged because they were grounded in belief. Belief. A notion of faith that centered upon the gospel preached and heard and responded to, though in varying ways among the, the reformers. 
the reformers saw Catholic images as detracting from this central message. Resisting what they saw as attempts to mediate Christ's presence through various means, they understood God's mystery as extending promise to our lives in a way that people become the body of Christ. And so for Luther, the images are not operating within an economy of transformation, wherein the image or icon serves as a window into a true image that lies always beyond and behind the image that we see that can never really truly be known, but it's only glimpsed. This is a part of the why if you look at Eastern icons, they oftentimes have elongated faces and fingers, odd big eyes, um, skin tones that are not necessarily the lightest, although for me that'd be perfect. But the idea is to say that the icon for the East, the icon cannot be an exact representation of anything because that's not the true aspect of who we are, right? There's always mystery and visuality mixed up in these moments. But for the reformers, for Luther and Cronach, they are creating a sort of visual cue of fidelity that serves as a mirror and a telos. Its aim was to reflect the viewer with an ideal image of faithfulness so that they would know what it looked like. And so what you get in these images are one side of faithfulness one side it looks like faithfulness, and the other side looks like um, looks looks destitute, right? Um, in a way, there's a kind of propaganda that's happening that we'll look at that we'll see later. So I started to get excited, I started to move forward. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa we got a progression here. Slow down, man. I just want to get to the end. I'm excited about the end. But this will be worth it. It'll be worth it. We got to go slow, right? We got to build build the case, right? Build the case. So if the reformers re resisted images, oh, oh, I almost see it. I almost get my own most important part. Okay. So what happens in creating these images? I want to suggest that the reformers unwittingly created an icon, even as they destroyed the images of their churches. That is, in stripping the walls of their of uh, stripping their walls, washing them, turning them white, they transformed their preachers into icons, into images of the image that ultimately reified, hardened, and enclosed the possibilities of what any preacher could look like, what anyone who hears and speaks the truth could look like. Luther and the reformers reflect an attempt to dam up the currents of visuality, to redirect its energy, and in doing so, created new icons and new images imprinted upon our bodies, work that the Enlightenment would build upon with tragic and enduring consequences for so many of us. If I were to quote the, dear, the good book of Harry Potter, <laughs> they, were, they were the horcrux they never intended to make. <laughs> ah, some of you all read the book. Some of you got that. Some of you are all like, oh, I don't know what that means. That's okay. So if the reformers resisted images as mediating or drawing us into the mysteries of God's presence, what were images for then? I want to suggest that we see four kind of visual enactments in the development of Protestant church life. The first was the pedagogical invocation of images. Whether images of Cronach the Elder or Holbein the Younger, paintings, woodcuts, altarpieces, served to highlight foundational messages of the gospel. Perhaps one of the most prevalent of these was law and grace, which took on several forms, both in paintings and in woodcuts that were reproduced widely. Cronach's work highlights a world divided. On one side, we see a world ruled by law, the ruler of this world. We see death, we see disobedience, we see the devil kind of lurking in corners, right? But on the other side, we see Christ, the cross, redemption, law, and grace is a fundamentally an educational tool. What side of the tree do you want to be on? I want to be with Jesus, right? The good side is so good it has two Jesuses. <laughs> Double the fun, dead and risen, all in once. Right? You can have it all, and all, you got all the little cherubims on heaven. I want to be with all them. I want to be a little face in the sky watching over two Jesuses. That's for me, right? 
And so what's so fascinating about this is the Reformation, now we have printing press, right? And so what you can do is you have the kind of nice original, and then you reprint it. Now this one's a little scarier, right? <laughs> this one got a little bit more intense. Just in case you weren't totally clear about the first one, this one's going to be real clear about what's going to happen. What side do you want to be on, right? Now notice what's happening here. If you kind of are familiar with Eastern icons, there is a kind of dogma or a doctrine. So if you were to Google nativity Eastern icon, you would get a basic kind of structure. Like a lot of them would like the, kind of be done with varying levels of quality and color. But you would have a little baby Jesus and a little sarcophagus with a huge Mary, with a mountain and tomb and two waters going like this. All of them. It's a dogma, a doctrine, because the icons think, the icon writers, in every single line, there is a kind of deeper spiritual truth that's happening, right? In a way, Cronach and Luther have created their own icon, their own doctrine, right? A visual set of cues that get represented and reflected and disseminated. But again, what's, what's kind of, what they are reflecting is not mystery, but a decision, right? Not the kind of hope in what could be, but what does your life look like right now? You want to be the monstrosity or you want to be Jesus? Decide. Oh, I lost my place. I got all excited. So this is the first example. A second example of explicit images of reformers comes were more, oh, these were more polemical. Oh, let me tell the polemical one. Oh, what's happening? Sorry. Okay. I usually don't use PowerPoint, so it gets me a little flustered. I don't have a um, giant whiteboard. It'd be kind of hard to do a whiteboard, to all the, this whole thing is whiteboard. <laughs> if I could, that would be awesome. If I could have that superpower, that would be great. Um, so what happens here um, in the Reformation in terms of the icons? So historian, um, Houston Deal suggests that traditional icons of judgment do not disappear in the new Protestant art, even in England, in spite of polemics against religious images. Ordinances which prohibit image worship in violent outbursts of, of iconoclasm. These images are not rep repressed by the reformers. Instead, they are transformed and reinterpreted according to the tenets of this new Protestant faith. The images persist, in other words, but their function changes. And there's all this a very interesting little rabbit hole where you go down about the ways that actually used old Catholic images and kind of changed them and like smudged out certain faces and put in new faces. And so there's actually all of this, again, kind of current of visuality that's happening, right? The reformers say that they don't like images, but yet at the same time, images are serving and functioning a kind of use for them. So as the, as the reformers struggle to discern the significance of images, we see that for the most part, they actually recognize their power. Even while trying to determine the orientation of that power towards a more singular idea, salvation by faith. So as the reformers, so while resisting the implicit and explicit theological logic of the icon found in Catholic and Eastern Orthodox piety and thought, the reformers could only redirect this visual economy into terms that reinforced their theological commitments to notions of faith as the central aspect of their life. Now again, I have to reiterate here that the faith comes by hearing. And so in essence, what's happened is as you have a preacher articulating a word, right? What is going on here? But in a sense, the kind of materiality of the promise is getting ripped away from the bodies in the life, right? And turns into literal a kind of ephemeral word that enters into us and then has to be responded to through a spirit. Our bodies are not necessary in the preaching of the word. But in addition to these explicit rearticulations of image and ecclesial life, these Protestant churches also began to transform, transform even their ecclesial spaces. Two significant shifts are important to note here. The first is the practice of whitewashing walls. 
So one example of this practice incorporated into the confessional life of church life in Strasbourg, Switzerland in 1566 reads this way. The true ornamentation of sanctuaries, therefore, the, the, this is what the true ornamentation of sanctuaries should be. All luxurious attire, all pride, and everything unbecoming to Christian humility, discipline, and modesty are to be banished from the sanctuaries and places of prayer to Christians. For the true ornamentation of churches does not consist in ivory, gold, and precious stones, but in the frugality, piety, and virtues of those who are in the church. And so from this ordinance, we can see the hope, right? By stripping these ecclesial spaces of ornamentation and other extravagances, we are focused not on earthly wealth, but on heavenly wealth that this shift reflects a sincere adherence to Jesus' warnings concerning wealth and the ways that we can become bound to idols and status of power. At the same time, though, I want to suggest that these reformers may have obscured signs of human wealth and opulence, but if we are attentive to the economies of visuality that permeate any space whatsoever, they simply redirected this energy. But where? And so we see this, the slow shift in ecclesial spaces from an altar-centric space with multiple visual cues dispersed throughout the worship space to ecclesial spaces where most prom the most prominent visual cue um, is either the pulpit or a prominent cross or image of Christ's sacrifice above the altar. The reformers, in fact, create a new icon a new constellation of visual cues that form a new economy of visuality. In other words, these various reforms work together to form a new icon, the preacher. The reformers unwittingly created an icon even as they destroyed the images of their churches. That is, in stripping the walls of their churches, they transformed their preachers into images of an image that ultimately reified and enclosed the possibilities of what this preacher could look like. And so Luther and the Reformers reflect an attempt to dam up these currents. I already read that. So, I was getting excited. I got so, it was so good, I wanted to read it twice. <laughs> I was like, dang, I got to read So what is this Protestant economy of the icon? So to make sense of this Protestant Refor Reformation's conflicted understanding and use of the image, we have to expand a little bit on the Eastern theology of the icon. Put differently, the East theology of the icon, with its emphasis on the visuality of the word, enfleshed, um, enfleshed and related, created a related theological emphasis on visuality as a node of participation with the living word. And this gestures towards two realities. The incarnate word, in the visual, sensual life as interrelated in our life with God. In essence, the word and body are sacred. And in the icon, the sacredness of our body is illumined, shown, revealed. We are reminded when we kiss the icon and we feel it touch our lips, we are reminded that our, our bodies too are holy, that there is some sort of transference, there is a movement between the holy and who we are. And so for the reformers, though, or, so the incarnate word and the visual life. So in essence, the word and the body are sacred. And so the profane is erasure. It is the dismemberment of body and soul. This separation becomes signified in the splitting of person and image, such as in the iconoclast, or in later colonial and modern racial gender constructions. The, for the reformers, the sacred was bound to promise to word, to exhortation. The sacred was something true that hid beneath and all that we see either pointed toward sacred or away. Everything is the tree of good and evil. You are on one side or on the other. And to say that this is indicative of, an, of an anemic dualism is to miss the reformers' attempts to express the truth of the, early, the earliest disciples of Jesus saw in him, that to see was to point, taste, hear, to be touched. And again, I'm not trying to bag on the reformers. They were doing the best they could. They were, thought they were being faithful in a certain kind of way. But the reformers, in focusing on this word preached and heard, did not disperse the visual economy, 
Rather, like shockwaves moving throughout these spaces, the visual energy of this economy becomes inflected through the emerging Protestant cultural field into images for teaching, into propaganda, into architecture and geography, or de facto theology of the icon, but they did not realize the icons that they were creating. Part of what we have to kind of get our sense of how powerful this was is that now all of a sudden you, you don't need an image because you have Mr. Smith who holds himself so uprightly and he seems like such a good Christian man and he seems so kind and he never curses and he never cusses and he never drinks. That's the image of Jesus. <laughs> that is the work of the Reformation. Writing some 400 years later, on the other side of a world where bodies had become indelibly marked by race, gender, nationality, and sexuality, there is Stuart, Stuart Hall would try to make sense of just how images in the media or popular culture in, functioned to create and maintain the meaning uh, that seemed to mark all of our lives. He writes, the shaping and reshaping of space-time relationships within different discursive systems of representation have profound effects for how identities are narrated and understood. All identities are located in symbolic space and time. Like sexuality, they take place in the field of vision, as Jacqueline Rose suggests in her book of that name. And vision always has its spatial coordinates, real or imaginary, in a field or the overall gestalt in which the subject is perceptually placed. He goes on to say, to say that all identities are located or imagined in symbolic space and time is thus to say that we can see cultural identities as landscaped, as having an imagined place or symbolic home. What Hall is pointing to here is the interrelationship between images, our bodies, and the meanings that get ascribed to them that ultimately constitute cultural values and identities. To put this in the, in the language of our evening, Hall suggests there is a visual economy that shapes and is produced by any given culture. We all navigate these currents because we see one another and we make assumptions and classifications of one another. Or as we see one another, we are are kind of and so trying to process who they are through the kind of notions of knowledge that and meaning that we see through them, right? So there's all this stuff is always bouncing around. And in a way, this is kind of just a given in our world. You all say, duh, Dr. Random, this is 101. We all know this, right? But in a way, it wasn't always like this, at least not in the ways that we feel it today. So the Western resistance to veneration does not quite capture what is at work in the East that there is an underlying economy, or in my way of thinking, a current of visuality that shapes us. And this economy or current is not simply the icon, but it is grounded in the incarnation. And perhaps we could say that the incarnation is itself a condensation of Israel, itself as a particularity of God's presence in the world. That is to say, God wanted to be seen not simply in Jesus, but already wanted to be seen in Adam and Eve's recognition of one another, or even in this, these strange people called Jews. So in a way, there was a transposition away from union of word and body encapsulated in Catholic understanding. This is my bad attempt at um, I worked so hard on this. So hard. Yeah, hopefully it'll make sense. So in a way, there is a transposition away from the union of word and body that is encapsulated in Catholic understandings of Eucharist, but with, I think which also permeated Catholic understandings of art and image more broadly. That the visual could speak and signal something of the divine and draw us into it. In the same way that the Eucharist is a kind of holy mystery that we see and taste and touch and yet at the same time has this reality kind of underneath it that we partake in and participate in. So too are any image. All of these things are possibilities. And so the visual could speak and signal something divine and draw us into it. So in a way, in the Catholic visual economy, there are a lot of different markers. There are a variety of different markers. But in the midst of the Protestant hesitancy over creating visual images, Something strange happens. 
the Protestants didn't dissolve this energy of image and body. They didn't, uh, this vital interrelationship between what we see and feel and hear in the world. Instead, as Protestant past pastors and priests stripped their halls and ornamentation and color, pushed pulpits to the center of their sanctuaries, all for the sake of centering the spoken word of God, they unwittingly created a new icon, the body of the preacher, the one who speaks truth and divides the word rightly. In the Reformation's struggle with the significance of the image, we see a distortion of the body and its relationship to Christian discipleship. The icon is not the image, but the preacher in the pulpit is. The, icon of, the economy of the icon reverberates as a relationship between his, and I do mean his body, and a deeper truth. His body becomes med a mediator, the window into which the hearer somehow gazes and must discern what faithfulness looks like, but also what it can never look like. And so while the legacy of men as the sole authority in the church is certainly not new, I want to suggest that the Protestant Reformation is the introduction of a patriarchal iconicity that underlies the racism and misogyny of the modern world. Put differently, the Protestant Reformation subdued the varied and expressive possibilities of artist and artistic image and concentrated the iconic power of the image into the preacher himself, reifying his maleness as the normative arbiter of theological truth and judgment. By dividing Christian life from reflection upon images, the Protestant tradition was rendered even more incapable of theologically comprehending the difference that they would encounter in the world or within its walls, and certainly more subject to actually abusing those differences in their own theological constructs. And so as we navigate a world where differences of embodiment seem to be proliferating, and we continue to worship in churches where women consist of only 12% of lead or sole pastoral roles. And that number might even be a little high, way high, actually. Where few churches are led by pastors of different race or ethnicity than their congregation, we have to begin to account for how these theological challenges are not simply about a wrong theology, but also about the ways in which our bodies speak and how images are formative within our Christian lives. Our understanding of Christian life and imagining our lives together must begin to account for the ways that we see one another and ourselves as an essential aspect of Christian discipleship. That is to say, if our Christian life isn't accounting for our sight, our vision, not simply in terms of things that we should not be looking at, but actually sight as a vital means that draw us into the divine and turn us and transform us into reflections of the divine, our theology is decrepit. What I am suggesting here is more than a question of representation, as some sort of politically correct call to have, a diverse, have diverse faces and prominent positions. I'm not calling for tokenism. At stake here is something much deeper. When we consider the visuality of our spaces, our institutions, our classrooms, as not simply representational, but as formational, as doing the generative, transformational work of the icon, we begin to see everything that happens in our Christian spaces as brimming with possibility of visualizing the declare and declaring the truth of what God has done and is doing. That the word has come into the world, and it's seen, it's tasted, it's heard, God becomes incarnate in the world, not through an idea, but through flesh, through material, through color and sound and smell. The theology of the icon is important not simply because it helps us to understand whether images should be allowed or whether they're even useful. That's not the point. The theology of the icon is reflective of the fundamental truth of our human existence. We are shaped by what we see. And what we see helps us to create what is possible. We are formed by our sensual lives. And these senses constitute what we believe we are and what is possible for us. And if we are to live into the fullness of God's purposes and God's, deep, God's present kingdom, 
We cannot do it with ver without varied signs and, and bodies. We need them not simply to reflect the world as it is, but because without these variations, we fall into a constant temptation to stabilize the word of God into singular domesticated shapes. Every time my wife leads worship or preaches, she will have a young woman approach her hesitantly, usually with tears in her eyes, and she'll say, you're the first woman I've ever heard preach. When she did baptism, she realized, I've never seen a woman baptize someone before. And so while Catholic theologies of image certainly stabilize the male priest as a mediator of God, they surround that image with images of Mary, with nuns, with the Eucharistic table, with statues, with rosary. The Catholic aesthetic is a mosaic of bodies in material life that transfers this visual economy of God's work and life in multiple directions, in the very least. But in the Protestant refusal of images, and the emphasis upon a disembodied word, they transferred the full weight of this visual economy to the preached word and the one who preaches it. In that field of vision, we see men and women inundated on a daily and weekly basis with images of the word of God embedded within a male body. And in the same way that this circumscribes women's vision of what is possible for them, of God's life and promises as sounding in their voices and in their bodies. This image also continually reinforces the image of men as authority, as reflective of something in God's life that is more true, even despite the incongruence of the male preacher's words and so often his life. And so by now, it should be clear that I am advocating for a theological argument of varied images of Christian life and embodiment, not only in our churches, but throughout our institutions and spaces of Christian life. For the most part, I don't imagine that this is a terribly controversial idea. But as I hope has become clear, the image is not simply about different faces. If we are to live into, this incarnation, into the incarnational reality of God's work and life, in and among us, we cannot look for utilitarian images. We must begin to develop and live into a theological and spiritual understanding of image and body. We need a theology of the icon that shapes our communal lives together and begins to enliven our understanding of our body lives. The question of iconoclasm or iconophilia was never about whether images were appropriate or not. They were contestations of the visual. They were contestations of what bodies were for and what they could be, and what our lives mean together. And how do we make sense of this world that we see in the midst of us? Neither Luther, nor Calvin, nor Zwingli could quell the visuality of our lives together. As we saw in Luther and Cronach's collaboration, images could even be redirected towards the recreation of icons, as long as they weren't technically being venerated. But I want to close our time with a question that builds from Cronach. Where do the artists fit in to this economy? How might we invite them to show us a way forward? In a world permeated by visuality, should we not ask those whose lives are intertwined with this economy? about what Christian life might mean. The artist is the one who works in economies of incarnation, feeling and seeing, thinking the world around them, drawing from the phenomenon of their existence, of their faith. They knit and paint and stitch or carve something into being that reflects what they see in that moment. And through the witness of artists, we are encountered with the holiness of the world that artists see permeating the distinction between church and world, sacred and profane. Artist Carrie James Washington writes about his work as an artist in this way. And perhaps you might hear some of the resonances of, of the theology of the icon. There's a complicated exchange within a painting between the subject in the picture and the subject who views the picture. 
The artist wants to set up a negotiation between the two in order to draw attention to something. And what I want you to be aware of in these pictures is the act of looking. It's both the act of looking and then locating yourself in the relationship to the subject you're looking at. Washington's reflection upon the nature of his work should sound a bit familiar. In essence, Washington sees his work as working within an economy that is not unlike Florensky's description that we saw earlier in the paper. The description of, East, of, the description of Eastern theologies of icon both understand a continual interrelationship or reciprocity between looking and becoming, seeing and knowing. The artist's vocation, their identity, is grounded in this interrelationship between sight and materiality. There is no word without incarnation. There is no image of God without water and dirt and breath. So what is the artist but a mediator of sorts, one who stands between you and another and conjures something into existence that requires you to see yourself differently? to acknowledge that you are looking at something, that you are in the world, and that you are seen, like a sermon or reading scripture. We are undone and knit together again in ways that are made possible through the mediation of this one who stands and makes and creates in our midst, who walks with us, who prays with us. Without the acknowledgement that we are looking, that we see is only a glimpse of something, that everything that we see is only a glimpse of something. Perhaps with all of these varying images that are getting created again and again and again, perhaps our inclination to stabilize the one we, preach, we see preaching might become untethered a bit more. What if we considered pastoral ministry or teaching or any aspect of our Christian life as in fact an artistic exercise that is always navigating the economies of the visual, where our work is something closer to Ellen Gallagher's notion of work, where she says, I am interested in signs not as static, but as moving, as things that start with something that has already been discarded. I try to make my images through the unruly cracks in the edifice underneath which there is something to be protected. The Christian life is like this, an act of incarnation, an act of recreation, a life that resuscitates the moments of our coming into being, the first breath drawn in by those earth creatures so long ago, those who enfolded into themselves Yahweh's identity, into a people who would speak this God's name into the world. In the welcome of a young Jewish woman who said, how can this be, and, and at the same time offered herself to let it be so. And of course, in a word made flesh, a body, a life of taste and sense and hope and sight, to see and be seen. We might even say that this is true of any woman, of any LGBTQ person who imagined a call to ministry, who imagined that in their gut, in their mind, in their soul, they had a word for people. And yet, everything in their space told them that whatever word they had was meaningless because of the body that it was contained within. And yet, what do they do? Through a kind of artistic incarnation, a kind of conjuring, what do they do but create a calling, create a presence, incarnate this word through their pursuit of this. Every woman who is ordained is an artist, is one who has incarnated a kind of possibility because no one showed her that in her whole life. The Christian body is an iconic body. It lives as the artist lives and sees and creates, creating a life with, the con with constant recognition that we are seen. And yet what we see is never exhausted, never complete, never total. The Protestant reformers and their artisans, perhaps afraid of this sensuality, sought to obscure image and likeness, 
In many ways, the cultural, political, and economic conflict we are embroiled in, in our moment, can be traced to the legacy of Christianity that fundamentally refused the iconicity of our bodies in built spiritualities, institutions, in ways of imagining the world that could be whole without the material world, without the particularities of our bodies together. They built churches, lives, homes, and nations that were simply vessels, while the truth, the word, hope, and the spirit sat inside, waiting to be taken up into an afterlife, free of these shells that we are in. Like Adam and Eve, just after they ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, our eyes are opened, but we do not understand what we see. We hide what is beautiful too often, and we destroy the material world in our midst in order to cover it. But what if the economies of visuality cannot be obscured or hidden or smashed into bits? What if visuality is an inevitable reality in the world that we live in, imbued with consciousness and love and hope? And how do we respond to this world of color, to texture, to hue, to shade? If we are to begin to see the kingdom of God more truthfully, if we are to become a people who can see wholeness of our bodies and lives, who can see difference and not fear it, or silence it, or disregard it. If we are to become true images of God, perhaps we all need the artists to be our priests, so that we might embrace the artistic as a Jesus way, an incarnational and incarnating life with God and with one another. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to bestow upon you the um, Weeder Medallion, which every, every Weeder lecturer gets to wear with their academic regalia. check would be in here, but it's not. But, but you will be receiving an honorarium of $1,500 in your next paycheck, so thank you. At this time, I'm sure that Dr. Bantam would be happy to answer any questions that you have. He'll be up here when the lecture is over. We have some refreshments out there in the foyer. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We really appreciated having such a great crowd out to hear Dr. Bantam. Thank you so much. <laughs>